Coming up next on Arizona Horizons Journalists Roundtable, a referendum on state election law changes heads to next year's ballot. A change in leadership for Senate Democrats leads to charges of racism and sexism. And Republican leaders look to the state Supreme Court to reinstate new campaign contribution limits. The Journalists Roundtable is next on Arizona Horizons. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon's Journalists Roundtable. I'm Ted Simons. Joining me tonight are Mary Jo Pitzel of the Arizona Republic, Howard Fisher of the Capital Media Services, and Mike Sonix of the Phoenix Business Journal. Well, uh, groups opposed to a number of changes in state election laws have succeeded in getting their opposition on next year's ballot. We've been talking about this because the effort was underway. Sounds like the effort worked. Well, it's worked so far. I mean, it's uh, the Secretary of State uh, said that the referendum against House Bill 2305 had enough signatures to get on the ballot. Uh, I think everybody fully expects that there will be some kind of a challenge to this. This will go to court before it gets on the ballot. The court effort, of course, would be to prevent it from going onto the ballot. But they have cleared a major hurdle. This is the first time that a citizen referendum has has gotten this far, gotten on the ballot um, in 15 years. My goodness! And again, uh, the, the referendum is on what? Referendum is on a series of changes. Some of them shoved through at the last minute. Uh, there are things like who can take whose early ballot to the polls. Uh, there are changes in terms of the initiative law, the ability to propose our own laws. They say that you have to have strict compliance as opposed to substantial compliance, which when you're doing citizen initiatives is difficult. And then the thing that's gotten a lot of people very interested is that minor party candidates now have to get as many signatures on petitions as the Republicans or Democrats under the argument that you're on the ballot. Never mind that there are a lot fewer libertarians, if you will, than there are Republicans or, or Democrats. Yeah, but let me point out that um, on the statewide basis, that, that also applies to Democrats. So they're going to have to get more signatures than they've gotten, uh, than, than they're currently required to. So it, it, at least on a statewide basis, it really skews to favor the Republicans, and they're the ones that push that I'm, I'm, measure through to, at the last I, I'm Republican. shocked that the Republicans would push election law changes through that may disenfranchise voters and benefit them. <laughs> It's kind of no. impressive that this group of not a lot of nonprofit civic groups, good government types, were able to mm -hmm. collect all these mm -hmm. signatures because you've seen a lot of other initiative uh, efforts not be able to do that on kind of hot button issues. This isn't exactly uh, an issue that people you can explain to really quickly at the at the grocery store. It's a hot button thing people are seeing on the news a lot. So it's a kind of an inside baseball thing, and they did a pretty good job. They also they, had more money than mm -hmm. God. Now yeah. remember, the unions came out, the you know, the education mm -hmm. unions and mm -hmm. S E I U and folks like that came out and gave them the money. When you can hire paid circulators, it's amazing what you can do. But it still, it was a, a fairly short time. It was less yeah. than 90 days. They needed 86,000 signatures. They brought in like 146,000. Mm -hmm. About 139,000 were submitted for processing. And there you go. It's, yeah, 111,000 were deemed valid, and off you, off you go. And again, mm -hmm. this was does, these laws were designed to streamline. That's what, ostensibly, uh -huh. to yeah. streamline the election process because county recorders have a, a lot of difficulty and they were pushed through by what Michelle, this was Michelle Reagan's some, some uh, of this. Some of them were. The, the, um, the, the ability for the elections officials to clean up the permanent early voting <laughs> list, which would basically make it not a permanent list, um, and the ability, it, the, the limitations on who can return someone's ballot to the polls, those came out of the 2012 long election, the long wait for results and Reagan sponsored those bills, they almost, they basically died. I mean, they, they were dying on the vine. At the last minute, they got smacked into another bill with these signature requirements and the strict compliance on uh, the, the citizen initiatives. So it made it into a package that um, there was something for almost everybody to well, you hate. See a lot, you see a lot of political motivations like Howie alluded to, that to benefit Republicans, keep libertarians off the ballot, shorten the voting rolls, get those people off of there because they tend to want a narrower uh, electorate out there. And so you see just tons of politics and all these things. There's happens in other states too where you see the parties going after each other. Republicans want something narrow, Democrats want a broader system. So which aspect do you think brought out the most people to sign these petitions? Was it the, the quote unquote voter suppression? Was it the idea that minor party candidates had to raise more in the way of signatures? Well, I, don't, I don't think most people cared about the minor party thing. Certainly the libertarians got all, you know, jacked up about, as did the Green Party. I think some of it with the early ballot, folks folks like their early ballots. I think they like being able to send them in. They like being able to give them to a community organizer who's come. 
But I think the initiative stuff is what got some of the grassroots groups mm -hmm. involved. You know, the fact that you take the Sierra Club. I mean, the reason we have trapping laws in this state and laws against cockfighting and things like that is because citizens groups have gone out there and been able to gather the signatures. If you pre create new procedural hurdles in there, you basically made it almost impossible for citizen groups to propose their own laws. Well, you had, you had group, like I mentioned before, you had groups that have memberships that they can mobilize to sign these things, Sierra Club, the teachers unions, mm -hmm. labor unions, some of the good government types. So yeah, the Green Party, uh, libertarians, where they get 0.5% in an election, they weren't the ones that kind of ran this, but it was, it was more of, the, of a democratic coalition. I think, you know, it was sold as a way, as a voter suppression thing. This is gonna, this is gonna make it harder to vote. The committee that brought this to the voters is called the Protect Your Right to Vote Committee. Now, the other side, you know, is, is gonna, their campaign will revolve around, you know, this is to protect against voter fraud. This is why we need to reject this thing at the ballot, but, let the but law this, go forward. But I think that, that that's what, that the appeal of it was, you just sell it and say, hey, this is, you know, well, this is to protect your right to the vote. The Republicans' legislature's reputation kind of preceded them on this. They're <laughs> kind of viewed as being out there on a few things, and I think the folks on the other side were able to say, look at them, they're doing it again. But here's the thing, and it's the same issue that's being fought now in Kansas about the dual voter registration system and, you know, the federal form. All this talk of voter fraud, the number of people prosecuted in Arizona for voter fraud is somewhere in the single digits. I and bring that up when Tom Horn comes on this program. Mm. And yes. he says, we've taken samples, samples have been done. If you, if you extrapolate from the samples, you'll find that there are many cases. And you go, he, he moves forward from there. His supporters, goodness gracious, they move, uh, I've heard from them, uh, they move forward from there. So again, you're talking about what's, pro and, and by the way, why don't you prosecute him, Mr. Attorney General? Uh, there are more important things well, out there. But, but that's the problem is, you know, it's sort of like saying, I don't want to call, necessarily call it McCarthyistic tactics, but saying, I have a list of these people that's, who are known communists. Now, I'm not going to release it, but take my well, word for that, it. But, and that's the problem. Is well, you've got to take his word for and, it. And another one of the problems, because uh, A.G. Horn brought this up when he and Secretary of State Ken Bennett announced their lawsuit uh, against the Election Assistance Commission and the, this high number of people, and this is horrible and terrible, says Horn. Well, then Bennett's like, well, yeah, but you know, we don't know. Some of those people might be folks who just say that they're not citizens because they want to get out of jury duty. Well, you know, then, then you got to sort of about? truth check that one. So you, you don't know. And real quickly, you mentioned Michelle Reagan and having been part of the process here. Uh, she will be very much of the process as far as statewide races. Um, mm. Secretary of State, is she officially in now? She Yes, she officially announced her candidacy to be Secretary of State. She's had an exploratory committee since the beginning of the year. So she now joins a, a, a Republican field that includes Will Cardin, businessman Will Cardin and State Representative Justin Pierce. Uh, so we have a, a, a three-way, uh, you know, At race, least, yeah. a three-way big mm. name race going on right now. What does this mean to her campaign when this many folks are <laughs> out there saying oh, some of your ideas, we're, we're not crazy about them? Well, for the, re for the primary, I don't think it's a problem. I mean, I think she, she crows about it. She says, look, we put in some reforms here and those liberals, Democrats, libertarians went ahead and uh, and 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 uh, force the law on us. The Republicans, you know, they're probably all all gung ho for it. She can say, "I am a champion," and since one of the duties of the Secretary of State's office is to be the state's chief election officer, that gives a certain amount of street cred. Yeah, I, I think it's good for in the primary. Conservatives like most of these things. I don't. If she's in the general election, that's a hard one to really sit down and say, "Voters, here she pushed these this this complicated legislation." You know, how do you say that in a television commercial if you're well, in the general and, election? And not so. only that, but you know, now we're down to who's running right. in, in the exactly. general, which sort of segues us in the next thing in terms of. You know, well, and that's well, yes. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Before before we get to how he's nicely orchestrated segue, <laughs> <laughs> yes. I should point out that Reagan is the chairwoman of the Senate Elections Committee. Um, probably will remain so when the legislature resumes in January. And that gives her a nice podium from which to, depending on which bills she picks to, to champion, mm -hmm. to sort of advance well, her name, her name recognition, you know, sort of subtext, hey, I'm running for Secretary I, of State. Let, let me go one step beyond that and something that can come back and kick somebody in the you know what. Because the way the referendum law is worded, if they were to go back and readopt, maybe with a few changes, the change in the early ballot law, the change in the registration law, they could nullify the referendum and force them to go out and get signatures again. 
Now, I think there's a well, voter, voter I, kickback from that, but it remains to be seen. There are I folks who I was going to ask, mm -hmm. as the last question, I was going to ask, what if the legislature just says, we're going to redo this one, uh, go at it again if you choose? I mean, would they, would they do something like that? Uh, have, have, you, have you seen the chutzpah yes. that well, goes on in West Washington? They might because they want they want these changes. I mean, yeah. various you know. I mean, the, the elections officials, the county recorders, really most of them really want this. Some of this other business, you know, the mm -hmm. the signature requirements for uh, getting on the ballot, they're not so nuts about. But some of these portions, mm -hmm. they might. So they really do yeah, want. So it. But they, who's going to lose a race because of that? Well, right, the, the Dems will make a big. But, but how many? You know, I don't. If you, know, you, I think repeal, make if you yeah. repeal and replace, though, that that would that's. Well, th but they'd say, well, again, I think they'd leave some of it out, you know, let's say the libertarian stuff, and then they'd just say, let's just deal with early ballots. And effectively, I don't know whether that even, can, can you refer what they haven't repealed to there? Or since you've changed the law, that statute no longer exists, is the whole referendum. Well, yeah. there's, there's no guarantee it's going to pass anyways. I mean, right. it's, it's an obscure kind of inside baseball issue. Those things voters kind of default to no sometimes. So even though it got all these signatures, it's got to organize people in front of it, people may still look at it and say, I don't understand. Well, no, a, vote, a no. no vote would be really good for the people that yeah, want yeah, yeah. So You're already messing things up. Yeah. Um, all right, well, let's move on here. What in the wide, wide world of sports <laughs> is going on with the Democratic caucus in the Senate? What, what is happening over there? Well, you know, it's a family, and families <laughs> just all have their little issues, and <laughs> they all came bubbling out um, in the Democratic caucus room um, earlier this week uh, at when the Democrats, on an 8-5 to five vote, um, ousted Leah Landrum-Taylor as their leader. She's been the leader of the Democrats since, since uh, technically since like last November. Um, what I understand is that a lot of it was a communication problem or lack thereof between with her and Linda Lopez, who was the assistant. They just didn't talk a lot to the other Demo the other 11 Democrats about what they were doing and, and the kind of agreements that they were making. And they, they, there's another piece of it, and this has to do with what the minority party always faces, which is, are you better off making nice to the majority and Leah prided herself in her relationship with Senate President Andy Biggs, and maybe you'll get a few more of your bills heard and get, get your ideas out, or are you better off figuring they're gonna screw you in the end anyway, so you might as well just be the loyal opposition, go out there and, and, and use, do the Steve Gallardo school of, of, of in your face. And, yes. and that becomes the question, and it's a philosophical thing. Sounds like it, that sounds like the in your face uh, faction won. Um, yes, I think <laughs> you will have a more assertive um, Democratic leadership uh, coming out of the Senate. More well, assertive, but, but, but more effective? I mean, more assertive, but more oh. effective? Uh, well, you know, what, what do they get out of playing nice? What do they get out of playing hardball? They probably don't get much. They don't have enough votes down there. And when you're in the minority party and you see this in Congress, it's a lot easier to be dysfunctional because you don't really have to pass a budget or get anything done. You can decide whether you're going to be the loyal opposition or the not so loyal opposition. So I think it allows these, these kind of debates to come up because you kind of see it with the House Republicans in, in Congress and how they act and stuff. And so it's a chance to say, well, we're in the minority. Let's let's forward our agenda and be strong about it instead of playing ball with, with majority folks that aren't going to really give us anything in the end. I, I don't know. Perhaps the best chance mm -hmm. for that, though, was this past year on the, because the Republican caucus has changed a little bit, uh, notably with that departure of Senator Richard Crandall, who was more of a, a moderate um, Republican. He's been replaced by more of a hardliner in David Farnsworth. So the so that faction of the Republicans is sort of has strengthened a bit. Oh, the Democrats could had a little more of a wedge when Crandall was in there. So who is Anna Tovar, and how will she do things differently? Well, uh, she's from the West Valley, and she. Uh, how will she do things? You know, it's hard to say because until you're in that seat, but I think you'll see more challenges of some of what the majority does. You, you may even see more calls for a roll call to put Republicans on the record on some of their votes so they can be used in the election. Uh, you know, less cooperation perhaps in terms of even suspending some of the rules just because, you know, hey, look, we're part of this process too. And, and I think that now she's answering to a more energized caucus, and so a lot of what Anna does depends on what her caucus wants her to do. But one thing she's going to have to do, since communication seemed to be, you know, pretty much at the heart of this, is that there were five Democrats who, who walked out of that caucus, yeah. and they were not happy. And well, she's got she's going to have to reach out to those people and bring them in. If in, if indeed the complaint against the 
now old leadership was that they didn't communicate well. Well, here's the new guard. They better they better bring these yeah. folks. Well, in. I, how I, the, the quotes from from Leah Lander Taylor. Obviously, she was upset, and these were taken in, in, the, mm. in the heat of battle yeah. here. But to say the most blatant, racist, disrespectful move I've ever seen in my life. I'll never set foot in that caucus room again. Now, obviously, yeah, we, see, we understand hyperbole. We understand emotions taking the part. But still, uh, to go public with those kinds of statements. Uh, well, they I, tend to have a little bit of an afterlife, they, don't they, they? They do, they do, but she did walk them back. Um, in fact, there was supposed to be a protest this afternoon in front of the state Democratic headquarters by people like Jarrett Maupin and others, and they walked them back. And Leah's decided, you know, I'm going to concentrate on my bid for Secretary of State. And uh, they know they have to work together. Uh, you know, in terms of, is it racist? Well, then you have to assume a couple of things. A, how did she get elected in the first place if it was racist? But B, there is a changing demographic in Arizona. You know, the, the, the black community is what, maybe 3% of the population. It's not like it was 20 years ago when the large black community was all in a particular legislative district. It's very spread out. The entire black legislative caucus is, is Leah. So are we talking a divide here uh, between African Americans, Latino? I noticed that most that walked out with her were from Tucson. Are we seeing a north-south divide? Are we seeing a divide between House members who have moved over to the Senate and maybe see things a little bit differently? Are we, what? <laughs> well, I, I think, you know, with Latinos are a big Democratic constituency here. They're kind of this untapped voting block that Democrats always want to tap into for these big races. Richard Carmona, Fred Duvall will need to have a lot of Latino votes to win. And then Latinos look around at statewide candidates, look around at leadership sometimes, and it's not people that look like them. It's not Latinos, mm -hmm. it's not Latinas. So I think they look at that and it's kind of a natural inclination of saying, well, if we're gonna energize our base, we're gonna help other candidates that are they're Hispanic, we need to have folks that are Hispanic in, in leadership positions. I don't think it's a racial thing against anybody else. It's just a kind of a common sense thing to kind of energize and grow your party. Well, you know, Anna Tovar was in leadership mm -hmm. anyway to begin with. She was the number three person. Now she's mm -hmm. number one. I think this is more an issue of the new guard. A lot of the folks that, that supported Tovar's ascension to the leader are people who, like Senator Tovar, came over from the House just a year mm -hmm. ago. Energized, had their own plan. They were more collaborative. They, they, they wanted to get more things done. And, the, and Landrum Taylor and her allies, you know, are Senate veterans, and they had a different style. I think that's, mm -hmm. to me, that's it, 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 it does, and, and I'm, I'm more in agreement with you because it is style in, in the sense that the, set, the Senate has always considered itself the upper deliberative chamber and you know Leo get, fell into that, Linda Lopez fell into that. Well, no, sometimes you need to plant a few bombs. Well, you see, this, in, you well, see this also in the Phoenix City, City Council race with, with Warren Sturt and Michael Johnson's seat, which has been held by African Americans for a number of years. That's gonna, probably going to switch over and you do see undercurrents of that, of this kind of changing Democratic Democratic Party, and are we, you know, do we need to have African American representation in that in that seat? Last question on this: the incident, the response to the incident, impact on a Secretary of State run by Leah Landrum Taylor. Um, well, it depends if she's running alone for the um, Democratic mm -hmm. nomination or if other people might get in. A certain former Attorney <laughs> General who's <laughs> sitting around going. Uh-huh. All right. Thank you, Howie. That was a little <laughs> discomforting to see. All right. <laughs> Who is Rick Murphy? Why does he want to be governor? And could he be uh, the proverbial fly in the ointment? Well, let's start off with, you know, the last time we talked about Rick Murphy around the table was a different Rick Murphy. Different this is Rick not Murphy. the guy from clear. Glendale. This is not the lawmaker who's gotten into a little, little you know, public eye. Rick Murphy owns a bunch of radio stations in Northwest Arizona. In 2004, he ran in the Republican primary, lost to Trent Franks. In 2006, he tried to put a measure on the ballot. He did put a measure on the ballot to say we should have all, voting all by mail. You know, very few actual polling places. He spent a half million dollars of his own money on that and lost. Well, that Republican uh, bill, we wouldn't have any, any votes at all counted yeah, if yes. it's by mail. <laughs> 2012, ran against Paul Gosar, a race that also involved Ron Gould, and lost. Rick. Has, <laughs> has spent a lot of money, you know, building up his name ID, and he said, you know, I want to be governor, but I want to be governor as an independent. And his contention is that he will draw people who are disaffected with both parties or disillusioned with both parties. The problem is... He's a, he was a registered Republican before he decided yes, to run the, the I mean, literally the day before. The only way he has any, any impact on a race is if we're talking about 1% 
you know, two percent, so a really mm -hmm. tight race where, where it's really close. I think that's the only impact but he has. His name ID, you know, p few political people know him, but he's up in Kingman, Lake Havasu City, you know, uh, but he's Nevada. Not, he but does but not have a name ID to have the big impact. Understood. But you've got the issue of if he runs with public money, if he gets the signatures, he gets 1.3 million handed to him. We also know he's got plenty mm -hmm. of private money, so we don't know which way he's running. He hasn't decided yet. For those who've been around a while, you may remember a guy named Bill Schultz, apartment owner, mm -hmm. uh, uh, complex owners. Bill was going to run in, in 1986 for governor as a Democrat. Then he wasn't going to run. Then he was, and he wasn't. And finally, Carolyn Warner gets in the race as a Democrat. Certain small Pontiac dealer named Ev Meekham gets in the race. And Bill says, I know. I want to be governor. I'm running as an independent. All of a sudden, you have a th very publicized very expensive three-way race. Bill Schultz put in 2.2 million of his own money and became a spoiler. Ev Meekin became governor with a plurality of the votes. And that's the kind of role I think that a lot of folks are concerned that he could play, particularly for the Republicans, because he is much more of a Republican in philosophy than a Democrat. All right, we'll see what, how that happens. It, again, the, the correlation would be, I think, closer if Rick Murphy were more, of, let's, let's say, a Ken Bennett or more of a, uh, a Doug Ducey, a, a major player before losing out or deciding, I'm not going to win the primary, I'm going to jump over to an independent. Well, I it, mean, Bill it, Schultz was, was a, a big name. He was a he name. He had, he had run, he had run in 1980. Half the valley rented from him. Well, well, yeah. <laughs> and he had run against Barry Goldwater in yes. 1980, so you know, the Murphy's, energy for the 80s. Yeah. Mur Murphy is not, but, but it's, it's a common name. And look, how does a guy named Dean Martin get elected? Well, it's a nice name. You know, uh, real sort of quickly, thing. the Republicans are probably going to go to the Supreme Court. Real quickly on this campaign. Uh, on the uh, campaign finance, the, uh, as you know, the Court of Appeals said we think that the changes, the limits up to $4,000 is, is illegal because it conflicts with the Clean Elections Act. They, we know that the Republicans who, who want the law, the higher limits, are going to appeal. But in the meantime, they're trying to dissolve the injunction. And their argument is that somehow there's irreparable harm to Republicans if they can't take those four thousand dollars. They want more money. They want more money. So I, let's take it for a we while. We want at more. Least. We want more. It's not like a commercial over there. <laughs> yes. and, there and, and there is a sense of you know time is of the essence because we are in fundraising season. Yes. Once the legislative session starts, lawmakers can't fundraise at least not when it involves lobbyists, and that's where they get so, most of the money. So oh, they haven't they haven't gone to the Supreme Court yet, but that, it's just, it's just it, we're just waiting it, for that. It, that it'll shoot be to Monday drop. or Tuesday, very quickly. Well, I wanted to get through that quickly, Howie, because I know that there's another medical marijuana story out there, and, and mm. goodness knows uh, you were on that beat. Yes. Well, this this is sort of an odd piece. Obviously, the 2010 law says that you can obtain marijuana for yourself or for a child, in fact, and that's never been challenged. There's a five-year-old who has a, a, some congenital brain conditions, and his mother used to feed him a sort of extract, which had the non-psychoactive chemicals that seemed to help with his seizures and everything else. Well, all of a sudden, the state health chief says, and the county attorneys say, well, no, the way the law is worded, you uh, can only have the plant. You have to have pieces of plant in there to make it legal. They can't get the extract. They're trying to shovel this, this, this straw-like material in the kid's applesauce. He's being a five-year-old, filtering it through his teeth. And so the ACLU sued and said, look, the law clearly says food products are permitted. So you cannot say, well, you have to have pieces of, of wheat in it, literally. And so they're going to go to court, and a judge is going to decide what's the voter intent on this one. Usable marijuana, including any mixture or preparation thereof, ACLU says that should be relatively clear. Uh, the intent would seem to be relatively clear, but we don't know, do we? We don't know, and the, the folks on the medical marijuana side have been effective kind of nationally in bringing out cases like a young, sick child to be able to put in front of the court and say, look at this situation, and then decide kind of a broader case. And it's going to be a very hard for any judge to sit there and, and rule against this kid's interests. And there, there's, a, there's a legitimate arguments in, with medical marijuana for folks that are very sick like this and these types of uses. And as we kind of develop case law on this, when you have a, a defendant or a plaintiff in this, it's, it really, it's really to their advantage. Very and, and, and very clearly, you know, the kid can, can have marijuana, mm -hmm. but you're going to have the kid smoke it, eat yeah, it, and that's, and that's the point. We're not arguing whether the kid can have mm -hmm. marijuana. The question is, can he have it in a form that makes sense? Yeah. All right, we've got to stop it right there. Good to have you all here. Thanks for joining us. Monday on Arizona Horizon, we will discuss the FAA's recent approval of electronic device usage during flights, and we'll hear about Soldier's Best Friend, an organization that provides service dogs to veterans. Those stories on Monday's Arizona Horizon. Tuesday. 
A look at the technical issues slowing the Affordable Health Care website. Wednesday, U.S. Representative David Schweikert will discuss what's happening on Capitol Hill. Thursday, we'll talk to an award-winning Encore career leader addressing a major social need in Maricopa County. And Friday, it's another edition of the Journalists Roundtable. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great weekend. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.